Welcome to Stuff You Missed in History Class from HowStuffWorks.com. Hello and welcome to the podcast. I'm Tracy V. Wilson. And I'm Holly Fry. Today we're going to talk about the Mirabal sisters who are a really frequent listener request, including from Magdalena, Chanel, Sophia, or maybe Sophia, depending on where she's from, a different Tracy who is not me, Jennifer and Jamie. These sisters fought against the brutal dictator Rafael Trujillo, who was nicknamed El Jefe or the Chief in the Dominican Republic. There were actually four Mirabal sisters. They were Minerva, Patria, Maria Teresa, and Dede. Minerva, Patria, and Maria Teresa were the most heavily involved in this fight against Trujillo. Dede carried on their legacy after they were murdered. Today, the sisters are national heroes in the Dominican Republic, but they were not really well-known elsewhere until starting about 20 or so years ago. They became the subject of the historical novel In the Time of the Butterflies by Julia Alvarez. Her family was involved in the same struggle against Trujillo, and they fled the Dominican Republic shortly before the sisters were assassinated. That book also was made into a movie starring Salma Hayek in 2001. Today, we are going to set the stage for all this with a quick look at the colonial history of the Dominican Republic and its neighbor, Haiti. And that will help put Rafael Trujillo's rise to power in context. And then it will also help us get a sense of exactly what it was that these sisters were fighting against. And I also want to note that this episode includes a lot of violence, particularly violence against women and including sexual violence. So for background, Hispaniola is one island that is home to two nations, the Dominican Republic in the east and Haiti in the west. And the northern part of the border between these two nations is the Dahabon River. That has also been called historically the Massacre River. It initially had that name after a massacre was committed there in 1728. Although today it is also associated with a later massacre that we are going to talk about shortly. Like a lot of other islands in the Caribbean, in the 15th century, Hispaniola was inhabited by the indigenous Taino people. Christopher Columbus landed on Hispaniola during his first voyage in 1492, and Spain was the first European nation to establish a colony there. Spain later ceded the western side of the island to France, and then the French side of the island became independent after the Haitian Revolution, which ended in 1804. And the newly established nation of Haiti later annexed the eastern side of the island, which was unified from 1822 to 1844. And what's now the Dominican Republic first declared its independence from Haiti in 1844. And then it became independent from Spain in 1865. At about the same time that the Dominican Republic became independent from Spain, the United States started to express some interest in controlling the whole island, in part because of its strategic location in the Caribbean. And after various involvements with both nations, that finally started to happen after World War I, first with Haiti and then with the Dominican Republic. The U.S. occupation of Haiti began after the assassination of Haitian President Jean Vilbrun Guillaume Sam on July 28, 1915. The United States had already been concerned about the nation's overall stability, and after the assassination, the U.S. took control ostensibly to keep Haiti from descending into anarchy. Then, the Haitian-American Treaty of 1915 formalized American control over various aspects of the Haitian government and economy. The United States occupied the Dominican Republic in 1916, and a lot of the justification for this was really similar. The United States was concerned about the increasing presence of German businesses in the Dominican Republic. As had been the case in Haiti, American troops were deployed to the Dominican Republic before that point including 750 Marines deployed after the 1912 assassination of Dominican President Ramon Ceceres. These two occupations had a lot of similarities. Both were ostensibly motivated by concerns over instability, including presidential assassinations and increasing German influence in each nation. Both of them followed years of American involvement in both Haiti and the Dominican Republic, including troop deployments. And both occupations were marked by racism, violence, and ongoing unrest and uprisings. 
At the same time, in the case of both Haiti and the Dominican Republic, the United States took the opportunity to try to make these nations friendlier and more accommodating to the American government and to United States business interests. This included manipulating elections to favor candidates that the United States approved of and putting pressure on both governments to pass laws that would benefit U.S. interests. The United States began withdrawing from the Dominican Republic in 1924 and from Haiti in 1929. Then, in the 1930s, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt announced his good neighbor policy, which at least in theory stressed non-intervention in other nations' affairs in Latin America. The U.S. didn't physically occupy the Dominican Republic or Haiti after this point, but it did continue to try to influence both nations through things like military assistance and loans. We have really, really barely scratched the surface of these occupations. We're just setting the stage for what happened next, which is that Horacio Vasquez was elected president of the Dominican Republic in 1924. That was in an election that had been supervised by the United States. But in 1930, he was overthrown in a coup. During this coup, General Rafael Leonidas Trujillo Molina kept the Dominican army from becoming involved rather than defending the government. Once the coup was successful, Trujillo ran for president, but also established a police force to assassinate his rivals and their supporters. So with nominal interruptions, Trujillo had total control over the Dominican Republic for the next 31 years, starting in 1930. And he was a product of the American occupation of the Dominican Republic. He had been trained by the U.S. Marines. He had been part of the Constabulary Guard, which was a police force that the Marines had established. An incident in 1937 really illustrates what Trujillo was like as a dictator. Because they had been colonized by two different nations, the Dominican Republic and Haiti had totally different languages, cultures, and priorities. Often the relationship between the two nations had been somewhere on a spectrum between tense and violent. But when Trujillo became president in 1930, the two countries had a mostly cordial relationship. The border region between the two was in many ways bicultural, with many people living there speaking some combination of French, Spanish, and Haitian Creole. Trujillo found this bicultural border region to be a really unacceptable threat. It was a threat to his regime. It was a threat to the Dominican Republic as a whole. He also thought the fact that parts of it were really remote and not well-defined would offer a way for rebels and insurgents to escape from the Dominican Republic into Haiti. And some of this was also connected to race. In general, the population of Haiti had a higher proportion of African ancestry and darker skin than the population of the Dominican Republic. So Trujillo really wanted the border region to look more like the eastern part of the nation in terms of culture, economy, and race. Trujillo toured the border region between the two nations in August and September of 1937 to inspect a highway that was being built. And after that, he decided that the Haitian presence at the border was an urgent problem that needed to be dealt with. On October 2nd, 1937, he ordered the killing of about 300 Haitians at the border, describing it as a solution to purported thefts and infractions committed by Haitians. It was a solution he promised would continue. This led to a tremendous massacre in which as many as 20,000 people were killed, most of them Haitians or Dominicans of Haitian descent. Dominican troops and conscripted civilians mostly used machetes, so this would look like the military hadn't been involved. This is known as the Perejil or Parsley Massacre because, according to some accounts, the Spanish word for parsley was used to try to separate dark-skinned Dominicans from Haitians. If the person couldn't roll the R in Perejil very well, they were assumed to be Haitian and killed. This is just one example of what was going on in Trujillo's dictatorship. In the years before the massacre, he had placed the Dominican Republic under martial law and renamed the capital after himself. After the massacre, he continued to stoke anti-Haitian sentiments and policy. He continued to have political opponents murdered, as he had leading up to his own election. He arranged monopolies and kickbacks so that he could personally benefit from Dominican business. He controlled virtually every aspect of life, including the press, the mail, passports, and air travel. So this is who the Mirabel sisters were fighting against, and we will talk more about them after a sponsor break. (music) 
As I noted earlier, there were four Mirabal sisters. The oldest was Patria Mirabal, born on February 27, 1924. She was named Patria because she was born on Dominican Independence Day. The next was Belgica Adela Mirabal, who was known as Dede, born on March 1, 1925. The third sister was Minerva Mirabal, born March 12th, 1926. And the youngest was Maria Teresa Mirabal, born on October 15th, 1935. They were born and grew up in Ojo de Agua, in the northern part of the Dominican Republic. The family was relatively well off, and the girls attended a Catholic boarding school. Their upbringing was fairly conventional for their social class, and all four women married respectable men and had children. Patria was the first to marry in 1941, becoming Patria Mirabal de Gonzalez. After Patria had gotten married, but before any of the younger sisters had, the Mirabal sisters caught the attention of President Trujillo. Trujillo's relationship with women was predatory. He had a squad of beauty scouts who traveled through the Dominican Republic to find attractive young women and girls to bring back to him. Some of these girls were still in school, The women were essentially kidnapped and raped and forced to either spend a night with Trujillo or to stay with him for a much longer stretch. When Trujillo traveled himself, families typically tried to hide their female members to keep them away from him. The Mirabals were invited to a party at Trujillo's estate in San Cristobal, not far from the Dominican capital. Invitations like this were really not something that could be turned down, and so they all went. And while they were there, Minerva Mirabal, in particular, caught Trujillo's attention. There's some disagreement about exactly what happened. Some witnesses say they heard or saw Minerva slap Trujillo across the face after their conversation became heated. Members of her family later said that there had been a very loud argument, but there wasn't a physical slap. Regardless, Rafael Trujillo had made advances on Minerva Mirabal, and she had spurned him. Not only had she done that, but she had done it in front of other people. And this launched a personal revenge campaign against the Mirabals in general and Minerva specifically. And that went on for years. Uh, Past podcast guest Jason Porath has a rejected princess's entry about the sisters, and he describes Trujillo as, quote, a man for whom no slight was too small, no grudge too big. The sister's father sent repeated letters of apology to President Trujillo, but he was ultimately imprisoned. Minerva and her mother were also held under house arrest in a hotel until Minerva agreed to meet with Trujillo again. He tried to coerce her into having sex with him in order to secure her father's release, but she refused. Although her father was ultimately let out of prison, he died not long after he was finally released. Trujillo's retaliation against the Mirabal family went on and on, and it drove them into financial ruin. He was so public about it that people refused to do business with the Mirabals. The family was under constant surveillance by the Dominican Military Intelligence Service, who was always willing to hear tips about how the Mirabals had misbehaved or been disloyal. Minerva, in particular, was reported for everything from refusing to toast the dictator's good health to telling a car salesman that Trujillo's owning a particular model was a reason for her not to buy it. People who associated with the Mirabals were taken in for questioning. And that questioning often involved imprisonment or torture. This vendetta against Minerva Mirabal also affected her ability to study and practice law. First, she was denied enrollment for her second year of law school until she gave a public speech in praise of the dictator. Then once she actually finished law school, she was refused a license to practice, even though she had graduated at the top of her class. After all this ongoing harassment, abuse, and retaliation, it's not surprising that several of the Mirabals became involved in a revolutionary movement to try to unseat Rafael Trujillo in the 1950s. By this point, all four sisters had married, and Patria, Minerva, and Maria Teresa's husbands were also involved in the movement. But this wasn't just about their own family's experiences. The sisters wanted the Dominican Republic to have peace and democracy. By the late 1950s, several organizations had formed to try to resist President Trujillo. And on June 14, 1959, exiled Dominicans returned to the island of Hispaniola to try to overthrow him. Many of these exiled Dominicans had trained in Cuba and had been part of the Cuban Revolution. The Dominican military put down this uprising and most of the participants were killed. 
This incident inspired the name for the revolutionary organization that the Mirabal sisters and their husbands helped found. This was called the 14th of June Movement. It was formally established on January 10th, 1960, in the home of Patria Mirabal and her husband, Pedro Gonzalez. Within the movement, the sisters were known as Las Miraposas, or the Butterflies. In January of 1960, the 14th of June movement formulated a plan to assassinate Trujillo with a bomb at a cattle fair. There are stories of Patria and her husband and children dismantling firecrackers to make bombs around their kitchen table. But the day before this planned assassination, most of the members of the 14th of June movement were arrested. And this included Minerva and Maria Teresa Mirabal, their husbands, and Patria's husband, although Patria herself was not jailed. Then in July of 1960, with anti-Trujillo activities going on in the Dominican Republic, Trujillo attempted to have Venezuelan President Romulo Betancourt assassinated using a car that was filled with dynamite. He had repeatedly criticized Trujillo, and although Trujillo had already been involved in other plots to assassinate him, this was the one that drew international attention. The Organization of American States unanimously voted to condemn Trujillo's actions and to implement sanctions. The nations condemning Trujillo's actions included the United States, which, until this point, had taken a relatively tolerant stance of his dictatorship because he denounced communism. But after this assassination attempt, the United States withdrew its ambassador and closed its embassy. Facing widespread criticism and an international fact-finding mission into what was happening in the Dominican Republic, Trujillo freed several women from Dominican prisons, including Minerva and Maria Teresa Mirabal. Their husbands, though, remained incarcerated. Eventually, the Mirabal sisters' husbands were transferred to a prison in Puerto Plata on the Dominican coast. Getting there from Ojo de Agua required a drive over a relatively isolated mountain range. The Mirabal sisters made at least two trips to visit their husbands there without any trouble. They had to get official permission to make these visits, so they knew that they were probably being monitored and that they were making this trip at a great risk to their own lives. They were trying to work out a way to rent a house in Puerto Plata so that they could be nearer to their husbands. But on November 25th, while returning home from a visit, they were overtaken by Trujillo's agents. Patria Mirabal managed to flag down a passing truck and tell the driver to please send word to their family in Ojo de Agua to tell them what was happening. Then Trujillo's agents beat all three of the sisters and their driver, strangled them, and put their bodies back into the jeep that they had been traveling in. And the jeep was pushed off the side of the mountain to try to make it look like it was an accident. We'll talk about the aftermath of this assassination after another quick sponsor break. President Trujillo had made it clear that he thought the Mirabal sisters were the source of a lot of his problems. He was facing international condemnation over the assassination attempt of the Venezuelan president, and unrest was ongoing in the Dominican Republic, even though at this point most of the male leaders of the 14th of June movement were still in prison. On November 2nd, 1960, he had remarked that his two remaining problems were the Catholic Church and the Mirabal sisters. So it's really clear that he thought that killing them was the solution and would fix all these problems he was having. But their assassinations had the opposite effect. And today, that action is regarded as the beginning of the end for Trujillo's reign. Nobody bought the idea that their deaths were an accident. Apart from Patria's effort to raise the alarm, when their bodies were recovered, there were clear finger marks on their necks from where they had been strangled. The deaths of Minerva, Patria, and Maria Teresa Mirabal got attention in a way that all of Trujillo's prior crimes really hadn't. They were young, attractive women. Patria was 36, Minerva was 34, and Maria Teresa was 24. All of them had children. Trujillo started to lose the support of the army and elites that had previously backed his rule. Maria Teresa's husband, Leandro Guzman, described it as, quote, they fertilized the earth with their blood to bring about Trujillo's end. Six months later, on May 30th, 1961, Rafael Trujillo was killed in an ambush. Some of the people involved were members of the Dominican army. Although Trujillo's son rounded up most of them and had them executed, at least one survived. 
in the Dominican Republic today, the killing of Trujillo is generally regarded as justice being done rather than as an assassination. In 1962, the Mirabal sisters' assassins were put on trial, and this televised trial began on June 27th of that year. Although the men were convicted and sentenced to 20 to 30 years of hard labor, they escaped from prison in 1965 during the Dominican Crisis, which is also known as the Dominican Civil War. They weren't apprehended after that war was over. The assassination of Rafael Trujillo unfortunately did not put an end to unrest, violence, or dictatorial control over the Dominican Republic. Trujillo's successor was Juan Bosch, who intended to reform the government, but was overthrown in a military coup in 1963. This led to the civil war that we mentioned a moment ago as several factions tried to take control of the country. The United States intervened out of fear that the results would be a communist dictator, basically what was called another Cuba. More than 22,000 troops were deployed, and they arrived on April 28, 1965. In the end, the Dominican Republic's next president was Joaquin Balaguer, who was elected in another election that was overseen by the United States. He had been Trujillo's vice president, and he remained in power for much of the next 30 years until 1996. He definitely didn't have nearly the tyrannical reputation that Rafael Trujillo did, but his later terms in office in particular faced allegations of human rights abuses and electoral fraud. After her sister's deaths, Dede Maribal helped raise her nieces and nephews, and she protected her sister's legacy. She became known as Doña Dede, founding the Mirabal Sisters Foundation in 1992 and the Mirabal Sisters Museum in 1994. She also wrote a book whose title translates to Alive in Their Garden, which was about her sisters and their work. Dede died from natural causes on February 1st, 2014, at the age of 88. Members of the Mirabal family have gone on to be part of the Dominican government. After the 1996 election, Dede's son, Jamie David Fernandez Mirabal, became vice president, and he has served in other roles in the government as well. Minerva's daughter, known as Manu, became the deputy foreign minister. Her father and Minerva's husband, Manuel Tavares Justo, continued to be involved in the movement after Minerva's death. He was assassinated by former Trujillo generals in 1963. Today, there are memorials to the Mirabal sisters all over the Dominican Republic. Virtually every town has something to commemorate them, whether that is a street, a school, a plaque, or some other monument. On March 8, 1997, an obelisk that Trujillo had built in honor of himself was painted with a mural depicting the Mirabal sisters. In 2007, the Dominican Republic's Salcedo province was renamed Hermanas Mirabal Province. The museum that Dede Mirabal established is in the last house that the sisters lived in. And on November 25, 2000, the sisters' remains were exhumed, along with those of Minerva's husband, and they were all reinterred on the museum grounds. In 1999, the United Nations General Assembly issued a resolution naming November 25th the International Day for the Elimination of Violence Against Women in commemoration of the Mirabal sisters. The day had been similarly observed in Latin America and the Caribbean since 1981. That is the Mirabal Sisters. And before we move on to listener mail, I'd like to give a shout out to Eve's Jeffcoat. She did some research for the episode of This Day in History class that was about the Parsley Massacre, and I picked up that research for this episode during the context setting part of the beginning. So you mentioned you had listener mail. I do. It's uh, it's not exactly our traditional listener mail. It is a throwback to our previous host's episode on the War of the Worlds, which was also recently an episode of This Day in History class. And it's not mail from a listener. It is mail. It is mail that was sent to me by a family member that was so cool that I had to share it with everyone we were having a family email conversation in which my uncle brought up the War of the Worlds when it was originally broadcast in 1938. And he sent along a scan of my great-grandfather's journal. My great-grandfather was a minister, and his journal entry from October 30th lists the three different sermons he gave that day. It was a Sunday. He worked a lot. And then it goes on to say... 
When we arrived home from church, a number of people were there who had been greatly frightened because of a radio program which had depicted a visitation from the planet Mars and a number of great warriors that were destroying the world. And I just thought that was incredibly cool, especially because there has been some discussion in more recent years about whether people really were panicked hearing this radio program. And here we have a first-person source, a primary document from my family, suggesting, yes, it definitely did cause some people to panic. So I'd like to thank my uncle for sending that to everyone. It was a super cool thing. (laughs) Um, It's not very typical that I get email from family members that is uh, relevant to my job in that way. So thank you, my Uncle Tao. If you would like to write to us there about this or any other podcast, we're at History Podcast at HowStuffWorks.com. We're also all over social media at Missed in History. That's where you'll find our Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Pinterest. You can come to our website at MissedInHistory.com to find show notes for all the episodes Holly and I have ever worked on together and a searchable archive of every episode ever. Uh, And you can find and subscribe to our podcast on Apple Podcasts, the iHeartRadio app, wherever else you get your podcasts. For more on this and thousands of other topics, visit HowStuffWorks.com. 